Okay, so now, um, having spent so much time on the Rambam's insistence on justice, the problem that leaps to everyone's mind is, aren't there righteous people who suffer? Um, and key among the examples that leap to people's minds who have any casual brush with Jewish sources at all is the book of Job. And the Rambam is aware of this. And he has one place, part 3, chapter 51, where he talks about suffering righteous in general, which we will now study in detail. And also, he talks about the book of Job. He devotes two chapters of the guide to the book of Job. He has many different, interesting, unique, surprising things to say about the book of Job, some of which I understand, some of which I don't understand. Um, and he has one key insight, which I think is absolutely central for understanding divine providence and how the world runs and what's important, what isn't important, and what's valuable, and lots of other things. So um, the part with the book of Job, which is the second part of this chapter, will require from us careful, careful study and careful thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, th I think we'll be able to come to a conclusion that the Rambam has adequately um, has adequately shown that the suffering of the righteous, when we, the way we identify that, is not a, counter, a, a contradiction to his, to his um, presentation. Okay, so here we can start up, I just on to page 27. Um, what I just told you now is what I wrote in 26. These ideas, this is me speaking, have two important lessons for all of us. We are all disturbed when we observe or reflect on the suffering of great tzaddikim, people who are great righteous people. We may question the extent of divine providence. How far does it reach? Does it always apply? Or the purpose of Hashem's management of the world? Is it really justice? Or is it, does it really, uh, is it carried by the tzaddikim, great people? The Rambam's explanations can help assuage these worries. In other words, I'm saying that this is not just pure philosophy, but anybody who's living a religious life is bothered by these problems. In addition, indirectly, we can see some application even to our own life struggles, even if we do not account ourselves among the tzaddikim. In other words, when the Rambam explains why righteous people suffer, that's the worst case. That's the worst case scenario, the hardest to understand the most clearly seeming to contradict his principles. That doesn't mean that the explanations only apply to those cases. What we are learning is that there can be a, a seeming disparity between a person's record on the one hand and what he suffers. Maybe for ordinary people, there also could be somewhat of a disparity. Okay, I'm not perfect. Okay, I'm not really close to perfect. But I'm not terrible. And I might be suffering something which seems to be to be out of proportion to the mistakes that I've made. So these, these principles can be ap applied to everyday, everyday lives as well. I think, Abdul, in American jurisprudence, there's a, there's a principle that the punishment should fit the crime. And although that's not very precise, you don't want to, um, you don't want to execute someone for running a stoplight. Uh, you know, that, that seems to be a clear case where the punishment doesn't fit the crime. So these principles would be useful for everyone, not just for the outstandingly righteous. You have a question? Yeah. Can you punish for unfulfilled potential? Like, like Hashem knows what potential is. You don't, he's too proud to fulfill it. And you punish for that. Or is it only for, you know, time? So you could take, I could take your question two ways. Um, one way I could take it is, are you punished for inaction or only for action? You are punished for inaction. Absolutely. Many of the mitzvahs demand action. So if you are passive and don't act, you're liable. You've violated a law. If you've violated a law, then indeed you can be punished for that. If someone's life is in danger and you could relieve the danger and you don't, so then you'll be punished for that. So if it's a question of action versus inaction, definitely you are liable for um, illegal inaction. Secondly, you could be asking, what about 
developing my potential. It might be, it, it, could I be punished for not developing my potential now, not because it's inactive, but just because this might be an area of my life for which I'm not responsible? That's a separate question. And there, there too, the answer is yes, you could be held liable for it because there are mitzvahs that specifically require you to develop your capacities. In particular, one of the 613 commandments is to develop good moral and spiritual character. You are born with a mixture of, to be precise, tendencies to develop character, and normal stimuli bring out those traits of character in you, and some of them are good and some of them are bad. And then you are challenged to use your free will to develop good character. That is developing, that's realizing a potential. That is a mitzvah, it's a responsibility. If a person doesn't make that effort, then he has violated that mitzvah and can be held responsible for it. How can somebody know that they're not getting punished for punishment? How can you question punishment if maybe Hashem has a potential? Oh, but, but now this is a brand new question. Why is it important to know what you're being punished for? Why is that important? We, those words haven't come up in all the weeks I'm teaching this uh, subject. Those words never came up. Knowing what you're being punished for has never been mentioned. So I'm, I'd like I'd, I'd have to have to find out what, why you bring it in now. What, what has it got to do with the discussion up until now? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, then, uh, my, then maybe my words just led you. I'm there. You know, there are two types of questions. In in Hebrew, they're called a sheila the kushia. A sheila is a request for information. Where's town hall? I have an appointment there. So I'm not. I'm new to the city. Where's town hall? That's a sheila. A kushia is something's wrong. I have reason to think that it ought to be otherwise, and it's not the way it ought to be. I have an objection to the way it is. Um. What, uh, you know, he said he would meet me here uh, uh, 20 minutes ago, and he's not here. Something's wrong. This is out of place. That's not a request for information. That's an objection to what exists. You may answer it by giving information, but it's much stronger than simply saying, where's town hall? The Ramos worried about a kushia here. He's worried about someone saying, the suffering of this person is wrong. It isn't just. Your principles that say God operate according to justice are falsified, by this person's example. It's not just a request for information, it's a potential counterexample to the Ramos principle. Okay. Um, so in, in 351, the Ramos is addressing a contradiction. On the one hand, there is a connection to Hashem which guarantees complete protection from any harm. This is the one concept of, uh, of divine providence that we talked about, where you, the person receiving divine providence receives protection and preservation. So there is such a thing. And you would naturally expect that the great tzaddikim would be the best candidates for receiving such a thing. And yet great tzaddikim, who we presume have this connection, do suffer terrible tragedies. I chose my words very carefully here. He announces the solution as a great discovery. In the middle of a chapter, he says, something has occurred to me, and this thing will solve a great problem. Part 3, chapter 51. Three chapters before the end of the book. <laughs> I, I hope I'm not being irreverent if I suggest that this is window dressing. You know, He planned it 20 years before he wrote the book, and he knew it, and he put it in, but he's putting it at the end for dramatic effect. Uh, or on other reasons which I probably don't understand. But this, what he, this is what he's trying to solve. So this is what the Rambam says. When we have acquired a true knowledge of Hashem and rejoice in that knowledge in such a manner that while speaking with others or attending to our bodily wants, our mind is at all that time with Hashem, when we are with our heart constantly near Hashem, even while our body is in the society of men, 
when we're in that state, which is the Song of Songs, on the relation song on the relation between Hashem and man, which is the Song of Songs, poetically describes in the following words: "I sleep, but my heart is awake. It is the voice of my beloved that knocks at the door." When a person achieves that state of being, then we have attained not only the height of ordinary prophets, but of Moses, our teacher, of whom Scripture relates, and Moses alone shall come near before the Lord. But as for thee, stand here by me. So now, I want you to notice something in this paragraph because this gives the lie to a misperception of the Rambam, which is very widespread. In this paragraph that we just read, is Rambam talking about knowledge? Let me ask you something. Two minutes ago, did you know the two plus two plus four? Sure you did. You didn't, for, you didn't forget it. You wouldn't be puzzled if I had asked you. You just weren't thinking about it. When you're asleep, do you know things? Yeah. Of course you do. Have we even lost your knowledge? You have to research them in the morning, look them up on again on Google. <laughs> right? There's a difference between knowing something. You know, do you know where you live? Sure. And you knew it a minute ago also, didn't you? Yeah. You didn't have to relearn it now. You just weren't thinking about it. Yeah. Knowledge is dispositional, as you might say, knowledge is an ability to respond to certain necessities in certain ways. Uh, a current experience, what you're feeling and thinking about and are conscious of, is a, is a different matter. The Ramam in the previous paragraph is talking about consciousness, experience, feeling, emotion. He's not talking about knowledge. This is the ideal state of a servant of Hashem. Anybody who thinks that the Rambam thinks that the whole of Judaism is philosophy, or the whole of life is philosophy, and he's leaving Judaism behind, hasn't read him. This pass, this paragraph, and we'll see other paragraphs like, uh, like this as well, um, and it includes action as well. But here it's what we would call God consciousness. Focus on God. And the, the distinction that this person has achieved is that even though he is involved in other things, which does usually acquire, uh, require some of your attention, you're negotiating a contract, you're caring for the animals that are in, in your care, you're uh, receiving prescription from the doctor, you're doing other things, but your consciousness of God always accompanies what you do. That's a very, very great, um, very great uh, position. It's even the position of Moses. Notice here I write that the highest human spirituality is not merely knowledge. You can know even when you're asleep. The italicized words describe what we would call the vacus, mental attachment to Hashem. This is the condition that ought to protect against harm, not just knowledge. The idea of vacus is crucial to the Rambam's explanation of the suffering of the righteous, as we will see. It is also unduly neglected in explaining the Rambam's emphasis on the knowledge of Hashem as the goal of Torah life. We need to look at his description of Dvekas in more detail. So here again, back to the Rambam. He's speaking again. Thus the law, that means the Torah, capital L, distinctly states that the highest kind of worship to which we refer in this chapter is only possible after the acquisition of the knowledge of Hashem. The worship is only possible after you've acquired the knowledge. So the knowledge isn't the worship. It's something you do after you have the knowledge. Note well, the highest, now I'm speaking, the highest kind of worship is not the knowledge itself. The knowledge is the prerequisite for that worship. So the philosopher who only knows the truth has not achieved that worship. Back to the Rambam. For it is said, to love the Lord Hashem and to serve Him, your Hashem, to serve Him with all your heart, with all your soul. Hmm. Love, serve with all your heart, with all your soul. Does that sound like philosophy? Not to me. And I'm a philosopher. And as we have shown several times, the Rambam says, man's love of Hashem is according to his knowledge of him. Yes, the more love, 
the more knowledge, the more love. The divine service enjoined in these words must accordingly be preceded by the love of Hashem. So knowledge and love interact with one another. The more knowledge, the more love. That he says at the end of the, of the Hilchus Shuva. And the knowledge and the love are both prerequisites for this worship. See, even love of Hashem is not the ideal worship. Love is only preliminary. Now the Rabbim goes on. Our sages have pointed out to us that it is a service in the heart. I point out in the heart, not in the brain. In the heart. Which explanation I understand to mean this. This is the Rambam's description of this service. Man concentrates all his thoughts on the first intellect and is absorbed in these thoughts as much as possible. This is conscious thinking, not passive knowledge. No, no, no. This is what we call dvekas. We, in our terminology, mental focus on attachment to Hashem. The Rama goes on. David therefore commands his son Solomon these two things and exhorts him earnestly to do them. Here's King David speaking to King Solomon. To acquire a true knowledge of Hashem, that's one thing, and to be earnest in his service after that knowledge has been acquired. Could it be clearer than that? I don't think it could be clearer than that. Lots and lots of people miss this. They want to pretend that he's just a philosopher. By the way, this was the book he wrote for the philosophers, right? Not the sap he threw to the religious in the Mishnah Torah, just to pretend that he was from, and then and speak to the philosophers in the guide. This is in the end of the guide. It has thus been shown that it must be man's aim, says the Rambam, after having acquired the knowledge of Hashem, after having, how many times does he have to say it? Well, it got a lot, I guess, because a lot of people miss it. After having acquired the knowledge of Hashem, to deliver himself up to him and to have his heart constantly filled with longing after him. He accomplishes this generally by seclusion and retirement. Mm. Every pious man should therefore seek retirement and seclusion and should only, in case of necessity, associate with others. Whoa. Yeah, whoa, it's right. You must know, goes on the Rambam, that even if you were the wisest man respect to the true knowledge of Hashem, you break the bond between you and Hashem whenever you turn entirely your thoughts to the necessary food or any necessary business. You are then not with Hashem. He is not with you. For that relation between you and Hashem is actually interrupted in those moments. So it is a knowledge, right? It can't be knowledge. When you go out baking, go to the bakery to buy your buy your loaves of challah for the for Shabbos, you didn't lose your knowledge of Hashem. But if you've turned your thoughts wholly to the bakery, then you've severed the connection. Note that shift of attention does not affect knowledge at all, I say. Even when we're asleep, we still possess our knowledge. So it is not the knowledge that constitutes the worship. You may say, why am I drilling this over and over again? You could make a list of a hundred books that miss this. The Raman goes on. The pious were therefore particular to restrict the time which they could not meditate upon the name of Hashem. <sighs> to be involved in nothing else at all. Remember now, you, uh, let, me, let me sort of sum it up. You can have uh, three categories of mental state. You could have a person who's meditating on Hashem. That's all he's doing. He's just mentally focusing on Hashem. You have a person who's buying bake, uh, loaves in the bakery and he's buying bread. That's all he's doing. Then you can have someone who he describes, like Moses, who could do both at the same time. That's a very, very great level. Such a person, if he could do both at the same time, it means there's no necessity that he should be disconnected from Hashem at any time. The difference between times will be whether he's only connected to Hashem or times in which he's connected to Hashem and doing other things as well. But all the time you can be connected to Hashem. What happens to a person who is connected to Hashem in either of those two states and then loses it, turns his mind wholly to some other pursuit, cutting Hashem out? When that happens, he's disconnected from Hashem and that worship is lost. Not just a question of change of mind or you know, a loss of connection. He's calling it worship. 
Worship is something you're required to do, not voluntary, you know, once a week for Friday, Friday night when you dance and, and sing the Chadodi. Worship is something that's required. So then when a person loses that focus, something's gone wrong. Now, of course, like with any other part of life, you can ask whether he's really responsible, whether he has no, no alternative, whether he can, is able to control himself or not, but something has definitely gone wrong. Rejoice and the knowledge, like could that be the, the, the phrasing in the Rambam, the Likud, so to speak? Okay. Certainly not. I, I mean, I, I, I rejoice when I get a good mathematical yeah, proof. It's, 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 we, it's certainly not rejoicing in the knowledge. I mean, it's, it's, in the previous page, it says, it says that when we have acquired the true knowledge of Hashem and rejoice in that knowledge in such a manner, I mean, it does say that we, we, we just read it. Well, rejoicing is part of it. But that's not enough. Uh, where, where are you reading now? Page 27 in the, in the Rambam's uh, big paragraph. Oh. Like this. The first line, actually. Okay, but, but you're, you're stopping in the middle of a sentence. In such a when required is true knowledge of Hashem. And rejoice in that knowledge. You're in the middle of a phrase. In the middle of a clause. Not in the middle of a sentence, middle of a clause. Rejoice in that knowledge in such a manner that whilst... So you, it didn't say to rejoice. You rejoice it in such a way that it brings you to do A, B, C, D, and E. Then you've done it. It's not the rejoicing. It's that the rejoicing brings you to A, B, C, D, and E. You don't see that you're stopping in the middle of a thought? It doesn't say rejoice in Hashem. It says rejoice in Hashem in such a way that it brings you to. So the rejoicing is surely not enough. There is a certain moment in which you achieve somehow you reach that level of knowledge, and 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 from that moment you, you should rejoice so much into it that that would bring you to A B C D and so on. Like that's kind of like the, the, the yeah, and I think, it, but and <laughs> that that also reduces it because there's an and in the middle of the sentence when we've acquired a true knowledge of Hashem and rejoice in that knowledge. Mm -hmm. Now, both of them, in some, I don't know if this is commas here, obviously the Rambam didn't put in commas, yeah. such a manner that while speaking with others, etc., etc., we are hearts and everything else. Right? When you have it, and rejoice in it. And the result of that is that when, all the time you're focused mentally on Hashem, then you've achieved that, that high level. But the, the, the level is, the worship is focusing on Hashem. The worship isn't the, in the, the, the rejoicing. The, the knowledge of the rejoicing bring you to the worship. And the worship is the mental connection with Hashem. So perhaps the, the rejoicing is related with the love element that we were mentioning? Like no. Rejoicing has nothing to do with love. Loving is lo a relationship with another person or a lot of the thing. Rejoicing, I, I, I told you, I, I, I studied math on some level or other. Some proofs are very beautiful. They're very beautiful. And, and to grasp it, to know that you've grasped it, gives you a great, a great deal of joy, at least in me, right? That would be rejoicing in knowledge. That doesn't bring me into a relationship with anything. I'm not even thinking of the guy who proved it. <laughs> Maybe that's a failure on my part. <laughs> I'm not thinking what a great guy he was and how wonderful it is that the world had him and so on and so on. I just enjoy the logic. I enjoy the, I enjoy the, the understanding. Right? I, I don't know what you're working for here. I don't see it in the words at all. The only thing that is the worship of God is the mental focus and attachment to Him. These other things, the knowledge helps you, the rejoicing helps you, and the worship is the mental focus. The rejoicing is not the worship. So is he, is he just talking about a kind of mystical, he's trying to capture like a mystical kind of relationship that can't, can't be captured? Or is it, I mean, where's the practice? You know, where's the Judaic kind of, kind of relationship to the real world? Oh, <laughs> you want, uh, I know you have to go on. Not only that, but it's, it's one paragraph out of a 350-page book. Right. And in, if, you, if, if you want to see how this works out in practice, take a look at the very end of the book, chapter 54, where he describes this again and quotes a verse from Jeremiah, which confirms it. And then he says, at the very last page, he says, you know, we started explaining a verse from, from Jeremiah. Let's finish it. And the end of it is action. And you can't be serving Hashem without carrying out the actions. So the actions are also on the page, on a different page. 
Okay? But my, my emphasis here is only to fight those who think that the Rambam is a, is a philosopher and only a philosopher and all the rest is window dressing and that, uh, that it's knowledge of God that's the, that, that he thinks Judaism preaches as the real service of God. End of story. That's just, just bizarre. But now we're coming to the thing that we want from this, from this chapter. So now, again, um, he says, if you are the wisest of men, you break the bond between you and Hashem whenever you turn entirely your thoughts to necessity of food or necessary business. Then you're not with Hashem, and He's not with you. Well, that relation between you and Him is actually interrupted at those moments. Okay, so again, it confirms that the knowledge isn't it. Now, he says, the pious were there for particular to restrict the time at which they could not meditate. And caution others about it by saying, let not your minds be vacant from reflections upon Hashem. In the same sense did David say, I have set the Lord always before me. I have set him before me. What does that mean? The Lord isn't a, a, a vase with a flower in it that you can put on the table. It means I'm continuously conscious of him. I've set him as the focus of my attention or a focus of my attention. Because he's at my right hand, I shall not be moved. That is to say, because I'm focused on him and together with him in that way, therefore I shall not be moved. The Brahman gives you his, his paraphrase. I do not turn my thoughts away from Hashem. He is like my right hand, which I do not forget even for a moment on account of the ease of its motions, and therefore I shall not be moved, I shall not fail. That's the condition that protects. That's the condition that preserves. That's the starting point for the problem. Right? We must bear in mind, says the Rambam, that all such religious acts as reading the law, praying, and the performance of other precepts serve exclusively as the means of causing us to occupy and fill our minds with the precepts of Hashem and to free it from worldly business for we are thus, as it were, in communication with Hashem and undisturbed by any other thing. So, this is the purpose of religious acts, such as reading the law, or praying, and performance of other precepts, some of the other precepts, serve exclusively as the means of causing us to be, to be conscious of Hashem. A great deal of the Torah, one thinker on the subject, wanted to distinguish between thinking and being, no, I'm sorry, between doing and being, and he wanted to say, as a principle of the Roman, that doing is for the sake of being. Well, I don't think it's the total story, but here you see it. Doing these things is for the sake of being in a certain state, and that state is a state of consciousness of God and mental attachment to Him. These actions, like praying, like studying the Torah, like putting on tefillin, like keeping Shabbos and so forth and so on, what you could call religious acts, they are, the, as a, they have as a, their purpose, the mental connection. Oh, so uh, this is a misprint here, I see now. I, the next line should read, so the purpose of all the mitzvahs, you know, the, the, word, the, the, the word filler in, on, on the program, you know, it fills in what you think thinks you, you want for the word. And if you don't pay attention, you know, <laughs> Yeah, you don't correct it. The, the word should be purpose here. Now, <coughs> look at this next paragraph. It's, it's, um, when you are alone by yourself, when you are awake upon your couch, you're going to bed, you're going to sleep, you're alone, lying down in bed. Be careful to meditate in such precious moments. Precious moments. Tell me Aristotle praised the moment before you fall asleep in bed because I'm a philosopher. Tell me. No, he wants to be in the academy with other, with other philosophers, with, with students, to discuss and debate. He wants to be authoring his works, falling asleep at night. But you're alone. You have no responsibilities. Nothing's demanding your attention. That's precious because then you can focus your mind on Hashem with no disturbance. Nothing but the intellectual worship of Hashem. This, don't stick on intellectual. Oh yes, it's figuring out theorems. 
No, viz, to approach him and minister before him in the true manner which I have described to you. So he doesn't give you a chance to make that mistake, does he? Not in hollow emotions, not in just excited ecstasy or uh, other types of emotions, which as emotions could be applied to a vast variety of things, the Grand Canyon or Beethoven's Ninth Symphony or other great, uh, great uh, actors of beauty or, or accomplishment, um, acrobatics. No, not emotions like that. This is something sui generis. This is something which is only in terms of how you would relate to God. So again, as I say in the in the in the uh, um, in the bold print, I don't think we can imagine a philosopher waxing lyrical about the wonderful moments alone on the couch when he can meditate on Hashem. That's not what they. Okay, now in chapter fifty-two, he goes on with this. Yeah, sorry. Should we understand? I didn't get it. Like the, the, the religious performances would be the actions that we do so that we reach that state of being. That's, kind of I, that's why I said that I, I mentioned that principle, which is very appropriately vague, so you can make anything out of it you want. Um, and I say that it, it is a relevant idea. I don't think it sums up the whole of the Ramam's philosophy. I've heard people say that's all, he, that's all he has to tell us. I don't think that's right. For example, uh, Let's talk here about paying a fair price for an object in the market. Let's talk about giving charity. Let's talk about um, pursuing justice. Let's talk about stopping someone who's going to commit murder or injury. Is the Roman going to tell us that the whole purpose of those is to fill your mind with religious principles so you can focus your mind on God? It's not obvious. Certainly not obvious. He did say religious acts. Religious is a qualifier. Mm -hmm. That means religious as opposed to other acts that aren't religious acts. So there's a lot more to say in the subject. Mm -hmm. But what we would call specifically symbolic religious actions, like praying, like reading the Torah, like reading the Torah and so forth and so on, or tefillin and Shabbos and, those, and what are called edos in the biblical terminology, there, he's telling us, uh, let me see if I can sort of make this, so make this relevant. He's, he's, his is not the only view. The, another view is that every mitzvah is connected to some kind of metaphysical reality. So when you put the leather straps and the leather boxes on your arm and on your head, you're moving the upper worlds. You're opening up gates of, of, of influence into the world and, you know, and so forth and so on. You're interconnected by fields of force you know, that, that, uh, that affect the way the whole world runs. He's not telling us that. There are mitzvahs, which we would call like the religious mitzvahs. He says the function is to focus your mind, because this is the true worship of Hashem. Um, and th that requires mental focus, and that's the purpose. The purpose is to create that mental focus. But whether he would say that about all 613 commandments, especially the ones that we classify as mishpatim, those whose our intellect enables us to understand that they are required, um, it's not obvious at all. And from the very last page in the guide, I would say it's quite, quite clear that's not so. Yeah? Does the Rambam state anywhere anything that would suggest that he thinks this mental state is a foreshadowing or even a preparation for the state of being close to Hashem and Shemayim, like what that's like? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And in this world, it, for the ordinary person, it foreshadows prophecy. That's why he used Moses as the ex prime example of someone who could do this. And, I mean, that's exactly right. Really? Yeah. Right. Then, if the purpose of this connection, then what does the actual content of the mitzvah have to do with that connection? Or is there a, is there a, a connection between the actual okay. content okay. of the mitzvah and the connection? So let me let me let me say something which, if you don't know it, may be a little bit surprising. The Zohar Hakadosh, the Zohar says we should re refer to 613 strategies. Hmm mm is right. Tayyak itim in Aramaic. Now, what is a strategy? 
A strategy is a procedure by which you get something else. 613, all of them, are strategies by which you get something else. So they're not self-contained. They're not self-justifying. Self you have to ask yourself, what does performing this mitzvah lead to that the Torah wants me to get to? And there are two ways to, to describe this. The superficial way is to get to human perfection, to get to the highest, most fulfilled possible state that a human being can, can get. But that's superficial because it's limited to describing the human being and it doesn't tell you what the perfection consists in. <coughs> and the perfection consists in the Vekus, second chapter of the way of God. The whole purpose of our creation is Vekus, to be attached to Hashem, which sounds very much like what the Rambam is saying, right? And let me make another political uh, insertion. The Rambam, who's supposed to be the arch-philosopher, and the Ramchal, one of the greatest of the Kabbalists of the whole Jewish tradition, are saying exactly the same thing. Hmm, that should give you pause if you think there's a giant schism and a giant warfare between the rationalists and the mystics and so forth and so on. Hmm, and there's lots of other things. It was pointed out to me by my Chavusa 40 years ago. The Ramchal quotes the Rambam dozens of times, and he never quotes the Rambam, never. The Rambam is the arch Kabbalist of the, of the, of the Rishonim. The Rambam, someone asked me the other day whether the Rambam was a Kabbalist for to the vast majority of the opinions certainly wasn't. And yet, the Ramchal, the Kabbalist, quotes the Rambam dozens of times in detail for substantive uh, subjects. He doesn't agree with everything, but a great deal he does. So uh, the idea that there's a warring you know, between the two of them is more. So what were you saying about the contents, though? So you, have, uh, you, you asked, whether, what about the content of the mitzvah itself? Yeah. I'm pointing out to you that those words may have no application. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't function on the content. You shouldn't focus on the content of the mitzvah itself. You don't focus on the content of the, of the strategy. You focus on what the strategy is supposed to achieve. Is there a reason for why the content is the way that it is? Sure. That, you know, if, 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 the, if the general says, take that hill and do it with only the tanks, mm -hmm. you say, well, he must have a reason why he's only using tanks. He must use that hill, not the other hill. Right? I mean, so I know what it is, but I don't know what it's for. I don't know what its purpose or value is. I mean, if you're talking about the purpose or value, I think that was what you were referring to. You were yeah. referring to the mechanics of how, how, how black leather straps on the filament have to be. Mm -hmm. You're talking about what's it, what is it for, what does it do? That's what Rambam's talking about here. Mm -hmm. right? so, I'm, so I'm showing you that when the Rambam says it's all focused on producing a certain state of mind, the, and the state of mind, he divide, describes it in terms which are the terms of the Vekus, and the Zohar Akkadah says exactly the same thing. Is that compatible also with the view that you mentioned of, let's say when you do certain mitzvahs, it has an effect in Shemayim, and there are certain gates that are opening. Are those views compatible? Or they have to sure be they're compatible, because from the point of view of the, of the Zohar and the, and, the, and the Kabbalah, all of that is part of the mechanism by which you get to the Vekus. But for the person performing the mitzvah, it's much more immediate if he thinks that he's opening gates of divine influence coming into the world and the whole world is benefiting from it. And uh, he doesn't, he doesn't t take it to the end. And what's that divine influence for? More rainfall? A better crop? You know, a bigger uh, profits on, 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 on Wall Street? I mean, wh what is all of that for? It's all for, the, in the end, of Tvekas. Tvekas of, uh, of people in, in the Kodesh Baruch Right? And then, if that's true, then he has to focus on his own vacus as well. Not just his opening these things. The purpose is vacus, so he's doing it. He should try to see that it will bring him to the vacus. Yeah? Um, well, there, there's a very famous story about uh, um, there was like a person that didn't know how to express his prayer. So he, he just uh, thought to himself that I will just say the letters, of, which is the only thing he knew. And, and the level of the vacus of the vacus that reached his his uh, um, prayers like I think I don't remember what there was like the rabbi in the in the he said like, like it was a Chassid Shirevi who said yeah his prayers are, are opening the doors the Gemara has a, a phrase that it uses over and over again and it has various meanings in various places but the bottom line is Rachman Aliba boy God wants the heart now if you take into account that all of your resources, all of your accomplishments 
our divine gift. All you have is your will. So then, how could it matter whether someone has memorized the Siddur and all the commentaries of the Arizal and has mystical intentions throughout, and somebody else says, God, take my letters and make them into prayers, if each one is doing all that he can? And the Gemara says, Rahmana Liba boy, isn't the one who says, please take my letters and make them into prayers, giving God his heart? Isn't he? Must you have memorized all the Mishnahis to give God your heart? I don't think so. Chazal weren't joking when they said, Machmana Liba boy. And by the way, since we're on a subject which, well, which I have very deep prejudices, when there's a Gemara that says, Ashri Happy is the one who comes to the world to come and his Torah is in his hand. So does that mean that the great Rosh Yeshiva are automatically going to get a bigger share in the world to come? Well, Ben Gershom says in that Gemara, Torah Zviyado means Girsa. Girsa means what he memorized. Not his great insights, not his great new theories, not his great new comparisons and explanations, just what he memorized. What he took from previous generations and memorized it. That's it. Ashri Shabila Kabalakan and can say, I received and I kept what I received. Not that I created and, des and, and designed and invented and so forth and so on. The whole, the whole edifice of intellectualism built as an edifice of Judaism has many, many weaknesses. There's many, many weaknesses. There's a story about the Ashra Kaddish. The Ashra was giving a shear on Bitochon, trusting Hashem. And he said something like, if you trust Hashem, things will work out. And um, this Talmud was there, and it happened that someone, some worker was passing by, and he stopped in. He happened to hear these words uh, of the shir, that's all. So the Talmudim thought to themselves, really, all you need to do is trust Hashem. Let's try it for a month. We'll try it for a month and see what happens. So they did. They gave up working and they gave up, you know, going to the store and everything else. They're just thinking and meditating and learning and saying to tell them and davening. And this worker thought the same thing. That's what the rabbi said, you know. And so on day, on the night of the, of the 30th day, the, a, a donkey that was travel, was carrying stolen goods for thieves in the forest chewed through its tether and wandered into the um, courtyard of the worker. He woke up in the morning, and there's this donkey sitting standing there with a bag full of golden coins. So he trusted, and he got it. The students didn't get anything. <laughs> the disciples didn't get anything. So they came to, to the Ashtag. They said, okay, okay, you know, maybe he's a nice guy, maybe he's sincere, but look, he, us, he yes at us, no. So he called him in in front of them and said, <coughs> What were you thinking about during the 30 days? He said, the rabbi told me that God will provide. So he'll provide. I wasn't thinking about anything in particular. Just, I knew he was going to provide because the rabbi said so. And he said to the Talmudian, what were you thinking about? Well, let's see, if I say this psalm, will it be better? Or, you know, should I dive in that way? Will it be better? You know, what should I do? And how should I? Uh-huh. And he said, that's, what, that's the story. And I think this is a perfect illustration of Rahman Oliva boy. He just placed his hands, his heart, in Hashem's hands and said, that's it. And they were, yeah, but, you know, maybe I could do this, maybe I could do that. And so it wasn't what was being looked for. The idea of Rahman Oliva boy is a, is, a very, is a very important principle and applies um, quite generally. Um, now, uh, I, we, we, we could just start here on page 29. Um, this is chapter 52. The previous was 51 in, in 351 in the guide. This is 52. We do not sit, move, and occupy ourselves when we are alone and at home in the same manner as we do in the presence of a great king. We speak and open our mouths as we please when we are in the people of our own household and with our relatives, but not so when we're in the royal assembly. If we therefore desire to attain human perfection and to be truly men of Hashem, we must awake from our sleep and bear in mind 
that the great king that is over us, that the, that the great king that is over us and is always joined to us is greater than any earthly king, greater than David and Solomon. So this is now the beginning of a prescription of achieving what he described in the previous, power, uh, previous chapter. First of all, you know very well that how you behave depends upon where you are, particularly in whose company you are standing. And if you're in the presence of a great king, you certainly would guard yourself and, and focus yourself in a different way. But you think sometimes in the presence of a great king and sometimes I'm not. So therefore, my behavior changes. Wake up. You're asleep. You're in a trance. You're disconnected from reality. You're always in the presence of a great king. Always. So don't allow yourself the freedom to relax your behavior. You're always in the throne room. The king is always with you. It's fascinating that this comment of the Rambam is what the Ramah puts in the beginning of his commentary on the, his, his comments on the Shulchan Aruch. I want to make one remark about this, and I'm going to quit. I can't. Do, this is a, so, I feel such an important remark that I, I can't resist making. The Shulchan Aruch is the Jewish book of law and custom. The main text is authored by Yosef Karo, and uh, Moshe Isselis, when he received uh, Moshe Karo's uh, a, a book uh, uh, on the laws, Rav Moshe Isselis had his own book, and he junked it. He saw that Rav Moshe Rav Karo had already done it, and he contented himself with writing Ashkenazi glosses on what was basically an exposition of the Sephardi tradition. This is the book of law and custom. He starts with a quotation from the Guide of the Perplexed. Gee, that's not an obvious place to start your commentary on law and custom, is it? That's a book of the deepest Jewish philosophy. Hmm. The Ramos studied the Rambam. He studied philosophy. The Marshal had great bitter condemnation for doing so, and he answers it. What's the message? The message is that there are no artificial detachment. There's no artificial detachment between different Jewish subjects. All Jewish subjects interact, interact with one another and intertwine with one another so as to create a harmonious picture of a whole which has many different facets. What the Ramah is telling you is that Jewish philosophy, the deepest Jewish philosophy of the deepest Jewish ex, uh, uh, explicit philosopher who wrote is a guide for how you should live your life. And... He quotes the verse which the Rambam is going to quote. Shavisi Hashem Negdi Somi, that place God before me continuously. The, the Mishnah Brura, who's a 20th century central halachist, cites sources on the Zohar which say when you place Hashem before you, Hashem's name is written with four letters, a Yud and a He and a Vav and a He, and there's certain ways to elaborate that name that the, that the Kabbalistic sources uh, um, d- describe. And he describes some of them as this is the sort of articulation of Hashem's name that you should have in mind. Which means now that on the first page of the Shulchan Aruch, the law of, uh, the book of law and custom, you have an exposition of a deep Kabbalistic idea. So you have Maimonides guided at the perplexed, and the laws and customs, and the Kabbalah on the same page. That's the Jewish message. That's the Jewish message. Oh, yeah. Okay, we're